you know, for other theophanies in the Bible. And so I typed in to ask for a list. I think one that's not included on it that somebody else said should be, and I agree, and that was Nebuchadnezzar. <clears throat> Remember when he looked in the fiery furnace? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Threw three Jews in and looked in, there was a fourth. He said, look like the Son of Man. Mm -hmm. And so I would consider that another theophany. But I want to read through this list. It might take me just a few seconds here. Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, Enoch, Noah, his wife, his sons, their wives, Abraham, Sarah, Hagar, Ishmael, Isaac, and it shows scripture for every one of these, Jacob, <clears throat> Joseph, Moses, Aaron, the whole Hebrew congregation, probably talking about the uh, fire and the clouds, mm -hmm. Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, Joshua, Balaam, and yes, Balaam one time was even uh, had a theophany, Gideon, Manoah and wife, Samson's parents, Samuel, whoop, come on, gotta get back on the arrow, <coughs> David, Solomon, and uh, then it also lists Job, Isaiah, Micah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, including Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar and company of 1,000 lords at peace, Daniel, Amos, Jonah, Habakkuk, Zechariah, Elijah, and Elisha. And then it goes, of course, Jesus in the flesh saw God. And uh, all the people who saw Jesus, they included that in an earthly appearance, but of course he was in flesh. But people who saw him in physical and recognized him as Messiah after uh, his death and resurrection, of course, uh, included the Mary, Jesus' mother, Joseph, his earthly father, Elizabeth, shepherds, magi, wise men from the east, Simeon, Anna, John the Baptist, Andrew, Peter, the woman at the well, Martha, Mary, the thief on the cross who recognized him as being the Messiah, the centurion at the cross, all the disciples, Peter, James, and John, followers <clears throat> saw God in post-resurrection, Mary Magdalene and Mary, 11 disciples, two the two men traveling to Emmaus, John, 500 were at attendance at his ascension. And seven post-ascension appearances include uh, uh, Stephen, Paul, Ananias, John. Oh, number seven, not seven post-appearances. That was number seven. Number eight, the world, including Israel, will see God at the end of time. Amen, that's right. And so when you, that was just a, a, an overwhelming list. Uh, of those who had seen a theophany. And a theophany, of course, by definition, when we looked last week, really is talking about those who have seen or have experienced God in a physical way. So they either saw him in a physical body, or they heard him, or they <coughs> felt him, you know, but, but something physical. But I, I also want to present the idea... Uh, I think we sort of look, looked at it a little bit last week, that there are many other ways that God has revealed himself to many of us. Now, before we start on, on our stories where we share uh, an experience, I want to go back to just a very few things that we talked about last time, and I mentioned there that just because an angel would take a form, or Jesus would take the form of man, form does not equal substance. And by that, what I mean is that when Jesus was seen in physical form by Abraham, it did not mean that he was a man. He was in the form of a man, but he was not a man. He was still a heavenly being at that time. He became flesh through the virgin birth. And one of the things I didn't get a chance to really... Um, get into last week, there was a question that had been posed online, and there was a lady who was troubled by the theophanies, and she had the question of why did Jesus come through birth? Now this, I'm testing your theology, okay? I'm testing your theology here, so put on your theological cap, okay? And think outside the box, 
even if you're wrong. <laughs> Why did Jesus come through birth if he could exist in human form? Because he had to be man. Ah, uh, oh, great theologian here. Okay, because he had to be the substance. I just added that word to clarify. The substance of man and not just the form of man. And that's very, very, that's very, very key because the Bible tells us, here are some of the other things that I wrote down. He has to be kindred blood for the sacrifice. So if he was just in the form of a man, but was really still a heavenly being, and that, I'm going to tell you something, there are some uh, cults that present Jesus in that way. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, they say, he looked like a man, so everybody thought he was a man, but to them the idea of God loving them so much mm -hmm. that he would come down in the form of man to die for them is beyond their comprehension, so they choose not to believe it. Yes. It's important for us to understand, and this is why he came to the virgin birth, because he had to be not just the form of man, but the substance of man. Therefore, he was kindred blood. He was born into the Jewish family, Jewish blood. He was kindred blood that died for our sins. Do you think it's ever anything that we will truly be able to comprehend? Not all of us, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> You set yourself up. What can I say? We are twins. We know that. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, we, we're always going to have a little bit of shortcoming in comprehension. Now, I'm not, I'm not an understanding, mm -hmm. because the Bible says that we can understand what the Bible teaches, but comprehending. Comprehending and understanding are not the same. Huh? Comprehending and understanding are not really I think the same. I just said that. Okay, thank you. You can always understand. <laughs> Some of us can understand. <laughs> <laughs> um, we can understand what the Bible teaches. Just like uh, when you think about Trinity, we can understand God three and one, but to comprehend that is beyond our understanding. Okay? Now, it's important for us to understand that he was born, he lived, and he died, that he died in the flesh. That's right. mm -hmm. Why is that important? Because it's important to me to know that Jesus endured the human experience. Mm -hmm. And not only did he die, he suffered for us, but he endured as we have to endure. And he lived, listen to this, in the human condition, and the Bible says this, he lived in the human condition and yet was without sin. He felt the same pains, he, you know, heart, the heartaches, experienced the death, death of his father, the death of his, uh, John the Baptist, his cousin. Um, the, the list goes on. He endured the human experience, and I mentioned that last week. That's important because we know that we have a God through Jesus that has empathy, has entered into our own experience of life. Not just a God who has sympathy, <coughs> but sits outside and says, Oh, I'm sorry that they're hurting, but, I, I but he know. has endured. And the Bible says that he has endured every temptation, even as you have endured. Now, maybe not every single specific, but every single category. He knows what it is to be human. Therefore, he knows what we need to endure. And so the lady that was really confused about that, well, if he could just come in human form, why did he have to be born? She really didn't have a very good theological basis of, of understanding. I think that my congregation should have, because I've preached on these subjects repeatedly. Okay? Now, um, let me go down here. An illustration of form does not necessarily equal substance. Just because something seems so does not make it so. 
and not in a physical sense, but here, something seen as a loving act might have ulterior motives. For instance, they're doing it as a bride, and they're expecting a payback. Mm -hmm. So on the surface, it looks like one thing, and, and ASL, it looks like one thing, but it's quite another. That's right. Okay? Yeah. And uh, in the physical, or in the spiritual, something seen as may not be the essence of what it seems to be. And that was when Jesus showed up with the two angels. He was not really in the flesh. But he revealed himself in a way that would be not frightening to Abraham and not frightening to Sarah. Because, and, but, but again, last week I emphasized what I, what I love is just the fact of how much that God really tries very hard to uh, reveal himself and his will to us. It seems like he spent a lot of time doing that. Oh, here we go. Now I found. Okay, grab your Bibles. Turn to 2 Kings in chapter 6. So again, as I said, that theophany is either is a, a um, revelation of God in the sense that we can experience him in a physical way, whether it be through seeing him or hearing him or whatever. Doesn't necessarily mean bodily form. He revealed himself in the fire and he revealed himself in the cloud. And, but it was something visual. The children of Israel looked and they saw and they knew the presence of God was with them. Can you repeat that? I sneeze the thought right out my ears. What? The verse. Second <laughs> Kings chapter 6, verse 8. Okay, sorry. Okay, I I'm going to read this story, huh? I sneezed, so that's what happened. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, do you believe in miracles? Yeah. <laughs> 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 you said you didn't say anything. I was wrong. I that. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad you're sitting close tonight. It makes it so easy. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, beginning at, at uh, verse number 8. And this is a story around uh, Elisha. And it's interesting because what was happening here is that a neighboring king was coming into Israel and they were going to go to battle against the king of Israel. And uh, the trouble is that God kept showing uh, Eli Elisha what the enemy's plans were and he would go and tell his king so his king would do something different and it kept thwarting the plans of the enemy king. Get the picture? Hey, hey, Elisha, go tell your king this is what they're planning on doing. <laughs> okay? And so that king was getting frustrated. Then the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him, and warned him of, warned him of, and saved himself there, not once nor twice. Therefore, the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing, and he called his servants and said unto them, Will ye not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king. But Elisha the prophet that is in Israel. Telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. And he said, Go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told me on saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host, and they came by night and compassed the city about. And when the servant of the, of the man of God was risen early, and gone forth, behold, and hope come into the city both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than that they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and saw, and <coughs> the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. 
Now what I want you to notice, and we're not supposed to try to make interpretation by what's not said, but at the same time I want to point out that it never says in here that Elisha saw with his own eyes the chariots. He hadn't even left the house. Get the picture? He hadn't left the house and his servant comes in. Oh, Elisha, what are we going to do? We're totally surrounded by the enemy. What are we going to do? And he began to fret, right? Whether Elisha saw them or not, we don't know. But there's no indication in the story that he had actually gone outside to see for himself. I, I really believe that he was just a man of such faith that he knew God wasn't going to let him be taken. He was God's man in God's place on God's timetable and he was doing God's work and he trusted God. That's right. Alright? But his servant, not his servant, they called him a son of a disciple. That meant he was a student. A student of Elisha. He was praying. And Elisha just prayed, Lord, he needs to see this. He's worried. And he needs to see this. Would you just open his eyes so that he can see the Lord's army? <laughs> and God did. That's a theophany. Because angelic beings were seen with the human eye. All right. Now, again, I want to expand this because as and some of you are talking to me, I think you're excited about thinking about sharing ways if you look back and you realize, wow. God really was there for me the whole time. Now, before we go to the next one, you can go look, but it's in, it's in John. I'm not going to tell you what chapter because you'll, you'll peek, and I don't want you to peek. Just go to John. Go to John 18. I, I'll give you that much. Go to John 18, and then you can get the ready. I just wanted to share that years ago, <clears throat> I still remember reading the story of a missionary that was out on the African desert. And he was by himself. I can't remember if I shared this last week, but was on the desert, out in the desert by himself, and he had his campfire going. He had to spend the night out in the wilderness, and uh, uh, he didn't know that there were some natives that had come that were going to surround him and they were going to kill him that night. But when they got there, they didn't do it. And he found out the story later on. Somebody shared about he was one of those natives that went on killing the missionary. I think later became a Christian. And uh, so he told them the story, and so the missionary said, well, why did you not come in and kill me? I was alone. Oh, no. Oh, no. You were surrounded, I think it was by 13 guards that were completely surrounding you. And there were no 13 guards surrounding you. But he found out that there was a group of men, if God ever lays a missionary on your heart, pray for them then. Because there was a group of men that God had woke up in the night and told them, you need to pray for this missionary. Thirteen men got together and they had a prayer meeting for this missionary. And God took the, the image of those 13, 13 men praying and transported it over to surround him in Africa where his life was in danger. Wow. And that's a true story. Now, I share that because... Max and I were in Kundigaba, but we are aware of twice this happening in Papua New Guinea while we were there. We were in Kundigaba, but once at the, and I've shared this before, I know, but once at the Bible College, when the rascals had determined they were going to come and create havoc on the Bible College, and uh, they, they came around the corner of a hill, and the entire campus, a 40-acre campus, was entirely surrounded by armed guards about six foot apart. I, they didn't have that many policemen in Mount Hobbit. In that very same year, the hospital, which was built on contested ground between two tribes, these tribes decided they wanted to get that hospital ground back. The government thought it a good idea. Hey, if it's contested, we'll give it to the Nazarenes. They'll build a hospital that nobody can have it. Everybody said, no, they weren't happy. And they were coming back. <coughs> and they formed a war party to go, and they were going to go into the hospital compound, and they were going to create havoc, which means kill the missionaries, et cetera, et cetera, to reclaim their ground. And they came to the hospital, now this is the very same year, 
and surrounding the hospital were armed guards completely surrounding the hospital complex. Yet today. We're not talking about something out of the Old Testament there. And Max and I talked about that later because we can't say that anybody ever told us that there were armed guards surrounding our home in Hoodie Dog. That's right. We, we had a fence around it, but then so did the other expatriates that lived there. They had fences. But in the year that we were in, in Kundilawa, we were the only expatriates that were not attacked by the nationals. The only family. There were nuns that were attacked and raped. There were uh, expatriates that came for the purpose of educating uh, the children in the community. Uh, they were attacked. Uh, and the list goes on. And there wasn't a lot of expatriates, but every expatriate, meaning somebody from the outside, a white person coming in to a black community, every one of them had been attacked during that same year that the armed guards were protecting the other compounds of the Nazareth missionaries. So whether or not that, that's the reason why that we were not, we don't know. But I kind of leave that as a possibility. The navies were restless, but we, we were protected. And so, what happened back in the Old Testament happens yet today. Oh, amen. Amen. Now, let's bring our minds away from physical manifestation. Now, maybe some of you have physical manifestations to share, and that's awesome. We want to hear them. <coughs> uh, we'll hear them up front. Okay? Because I think they're, they're great stories. But, but also to think about other ways that God has made his self plain to us. And we know it was the hand of God. Some of you have already shared. I know you've got some stories to share. But we're going to read. Y'all over John chapter 18? Okay, go over two more chapters. I tricked you so you wouldn't be able to read it. That was rude. <laughs> So John chapter 20, just two chapters over and beginning at verse 24. Now Jesus has already appeared, remember, to the disciples after his resurrection, except for Thomas. Thomas wasn't there. In verse 24, but Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, <clears throat> reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. You notice it doesn't say he ever did the thrusting part. Okay, but he believed immediately. And he said, My Lord and my God. Now, here's verse 29. Listen to this. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. Amen. Amen. Right. So maybe you've never had a theophany in the sense of physical. But blessed are you who believe who have not seen. But then again, we have the theophanies where we look back, like Carol told me this morning. She said as she's been thinking through this week about the lesson from last week, she said uh, that she looks back and she begins to realize, wow, that this was the hand of God, and this was the hand of God, and this was the hand of God, and it had never been considered before. And that's not a criticism of that. I've been excited to hear some of, some of you you know, stepping forward and saying, you know, I've been thinking about this. And uh, Ruby said she's going to keep us here all night. And, uh, <laughs> so, uh, I just want to start, and, and uh, we'll make Ruby the second person. 
<laughs> Ruby's and like, laugh, and let her share two or three of her stories, and then we can come back to her when everybody else, you know, clams up, right? Uh, so who would like to share a moment in time where God revealed himself to you? And and I would, I've shared some from Papua New Guinea. You guys have heard the story about the baby that God miraculously touched when we were pastoring in Sofor, Oklahoma, and the doctor said it's physically impossible. If you understand physics, now, Carol now understands physics. We had a physics lesson Thursday while the tuner was here tuning the piano. But physically impossible, and it would be. You take a liver this size, and you don't shrink it to half size. What happened to the rest of the cells? Okay? But God touched that baby, and that baby lived. I'm not going to go into detail on that because I want you to share some of your stories. Who wants to be first? Not everybody. I, you know, don't. Don't knock everybody else down on your way. <laughs> Out of my way. <laughs> okay, my story also comes from Papua New Guinea, and it starts on a nice sunny day as I'm standing by my dining room window with a gentle breeze coming through and the sun shines out on the grass. And it gave me such a peaceful feeling. And I don't think I heard the words, but God impressed on me. You will be protected. And I said, sunny day. That night, I did the chore I hate to do the most, and that was wash dishes at 10 o'clock. And I'm washing my dishes, the only light in, everybody's to bed, and a knock comes on the door. And I'm thinking, it's a student wanting to ask my husband a question, he's already in bed, I'll ignore it. And knock again. And as I go to the front door, my dog goes wild, and the hair on the back of his neck comes up like a wolf. And I open the door, no one's there, I let him out, he tears down the end of the house, and I step out to see who it is. I would have done that. But I did that, and when I did, that's when yelling and gunfire went off. And I'm standing at my house, I shut the door, I come in the house, the bullet had actually gone in above on the window where I was standing, and had split and gone into two different rooms. My husband was up by this time. We put the kids underneath the beds. Sammy is so scared. He is flopping like a fish on the floor. Sam is shaking all over with a little bow and arrow in his hand. I don't know what he's going to do with that. <laughs> Calling on the phone, trying to get some help. Police have been dispatched, and it's like anywhere else. It's going to take 20 to 30 minutes before they come. But the practice was is that the bell was rung. And every student comes out. They're wearing towels, they're wearing t-shirts and shorts. I mean, they are out with what? They have nothing but things on. And as they are running in the darkness, and these are dark-skinned people, they see where they're, the problem is, and as one gets close, he turns. And as he turns, he gets a graze of a bullet right across his chest. Oh it's like God. grease going right there. There were probably other things. I did tell uh, Ruby that we give her the chance at number two to share some with us. Sure. She's out of the way back there, too. <laughs> well, I can talk about Okay. <laughs> uh, when I was 13 years old, this is a story of our salvation experience. Uh, and it, there's a couple other things involved, too. 
but um, when I was 13 <coughs> years old, my daughter or my sister married uh, an Assembly of God pastor, okay, minister, and he wasn't. I won't go into all that, but he wasn't. And um, all I ever heard from him, I never heard anything about Jesus, nothing about salvation, nothing about you need to accept Jesus as your Savior. All I heard was you're going to hell because you wear pants. Well, I lived on a dairy farm. I was born and raised in Colorado. And we had a, a fairly good sized dairy farm. You don't go out and chase cows in a dress. <laughs> Not unless you want to get attacked. We're sure. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, I mean, this kept me out of church for a good many years. When I was 30 years old, uh, well, I came to college down in Kansas and everything. But when, um, when I was about 30 years old, my, well, the late 60s, my husband uh, was laid off from Boeing. We were caught in that big aircraft layoff back in the late 60s. All of the aircraft plants had laid off and there was no jobs in Wichita whatsoever. So we were in Colorado <coughs> to find a job. And we, we uh, moved out there. He worked there for a while and um, in Deer Trail. And then we, the next year we moved to Strasburg, bought a trailer, and they hadn't even unhip, unhooked the trailer yet. And, the, and a little red station wagon pulled up and this pastor came out and he said, hi, I'm Tom Fritch, I'd like to invite you to church. Well, I didn't want anything to do with church, period. Okay. And so I was standing there smoking a cigarette and blowing smoke in his face. <laughs> smoking? <laughs> I, was, I was smoking. I was blowing smoke in the pastor's face. And he just stood there and he just visited with us very nicely. Pretty soon there were two little boys, him and his little brother. He was, a, what were you, eight? I was about seven. No, I was probably about nine. Maybe about nine. And uh, his brother's about a year younger than he is. And they came around the end of the trailer. Well, that pastor pointed his finger at me and he said, those boys need to be on church. You have them ready Sunday morning at nine o'clock and I'll be at five in the church bus to pick them up. And I was to God, I thought God would strike me dead if I said no. <laughs> <laughs>
dad, I believe, was a true miracle. He was 76 years old. He had not been taught anything about Christianity, nothing about Jesus, when he was a child. Grew up, his father was a drunk. His stepmother didn't care anything about him. Get out of my way. And he was 76 years old when he decided to go to church because that pastor came out every afternoon and drank. He, well, he'd walk, just walk into our house and get a couple of cups, fill up a little coffee, and go ahead and sit down and talk to my dad. And he did that for two months, and my dad went to church and accepted the Lord. A year later, um, I had a vision at church one night. I was down at the altar praying. The Lord gave me a vision, and I saw my dad standing on this side, Jesus standing on this side, and my mother was in between. And she'd run almost to my daddy, and she turned around, she'd get almost to Jesus, and back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And I thought, oh dear God, I'm six months pregnant. My mother is going to die. My dad is an invalid. How am I going to take care of him? And there's no way I would put him in a nursing home. And so, you know, I mean, I was just panic stricken. And so I went home and I kept praying. I talked to my husband about it, talked to two other people in the church that interpreted dreams or visions. And they gave me the same thing that I thought, that my mother was going to die. And one night, it was about, about a week or two after that, I woke up in the middle of the night and this voice was booming. I'd never heard anything before or since. Well, that's why I say it. But it, the voice was just booming. And it said, your father will not see your child on this earth. Mm -hmm. Two weeks later, I woke up, the same voice said, the time's coming. The time, the time is, has come. I'm going to come for my child. And a week later, my father passed away. And that whole day was set up for him. Yeah. I mean, there was just, there was everything that he wanted came to pass. And that day, I won't go into what all it was. But every, uh, the, that night, the night that he passed away, or the day, evening that he passed away, about five o'clock. And Larry and, and his brother were in the room with him when he passed away. And, um, but anyway, uh, the coroner and his helper, of course, came to get the body. And the, the, uh, de de the sheriff's deputy had to come because he died at home. And the next morning, the, the sheriff's deputy caught our pastor on the street and he asked him if he could buy a cup of coffee. And they went in the restaurant to sit down. That deputy said, I have attended, oh, I've gone to homes, thousands and thousands of homes since I've been a, a, a sheriff. And he said, there was a presence in that house last night that I had never experienced. And I don't know what it was, but I want it. Mm. That's awesome. That's amazing. And it's interesting because by you hearing this audible voice of God, I mean, it probably gave you a sense of God's got this. Uh, it, it was. You know, and I mean, awesome. it was so, so loving and so beautiful yeah. and just, it was precious. I mean, I, I can't explain it. You know, and when I look around the room, I was thinking while you was talking, I was listening to you too, okay? But I was looking at Larry, that he had a, a wife that passed of cancer, I looked at Carol, yeah. a husband that passed of cancer, and, mm -hmm. pardon? Luther. And Luther and Greg, uh, having spouses that passed of, can that passed of cancer. And that's such a long and drawn out thing, you know, which gave me a probably was a decade or whatever. And was there ever a moment in, in those times?
times where you watch your loved one to suffer in that way that God has made himself known and present with you? I know the time that God made himself known to me. And I'm Speak up. Gonna, I know the time that God really made himself known to me, and I'm not going to go into details about it, but uh, I've gone through a lot of things and went through some really, really rough times where I felt like there was, there was no reason to even be here. But, you know, and God showed me. God showed me. And um, and he is. And I praise God for that. I love messages on, you know, God doesn't have to cause things to happen. <laughs> but God will use you right. because of the things that have happened. And I'll tell you what, God has made that. He told me. He told me that he was going to use me. And I'm like, God can never use me. I mean, I'm, I was a bad girl. I was not a good girl. And I thought, God. And, but you know what? God is God is amazing. Yes. Because he will bring people into your life. And I'll tell you what, I get scared when people when people come into my life of what I'm gonna say. But you know what? It's not you talking. Yeah. It's Christ talking through you. And um, you know, you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be afraid because turn over to God and say, God, you know, this is on you. Not just that, but I think of the scripture that says you don't even have to plan ahead what you're going no, to say. God no. will give you the words. That's right. That's right. And I've seen that in action. Uh, like the time Jerry and I had to sit down and wait at the <coughs> But God gave you the words that that lady needed at that time. And I think he uses you in a remarkable way. I really do. And Larry, are you going to start to share something out of your Yeah. Speak up. Uh, I got to share with them. I was like, tell them that I was going to talk about it, but I don't want that. We were down in that modification. I'm sorry. Sure. Sure. We were going on vacation down in that Anderson Hill, Missouri. And uh, my daughter had been diagnosed with cancer. We were up. Uh, it was like about a month or two before she died. Uh, she started uh, having a severe diarrhea. Nothing but green was coming out. And uh, I had to so I took her to the ER. And I swear I could have seen this before. It was just days off the kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I was having to argue with the doctor at the <coughs> ER. So she ended up going into uh, Joplin, and she's telling me, just let her just go home, get some rest, then come back up to Joplin, <coughs> then come back <coughs> Well, I went back down there to, to Anderson to go, and I was just kind of poking around a little bit, you know, just going back and forth, going back and forth. And I just like, yeah, I'm going to start crying. And my heart was just going down, I wanted to be there, but I knew what she was going through. And uh, then um, all of a sudden, just God's voice just said, Be not dismayed, be not afraid, be not dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you. The Lord your God is with you. <laughs> so then, okay, now, mind you, I'm in a non cell phone area, and there's blanket, nothing out there. I get a phone call from the hospital. It says, Larry, come up here. I just packed up, I just flew up there, it was a hundred miles to job, and I think I made it there in probably 50 minutes, 7 minutes. And after I was on the hospital, I hit job, and I was after directly, directly to the hospital. And they were trying to, because they were trying to do surgery on it. Anybody knows anything about cancer, you do not do surgery on for that mm -hmm. cancer. So I was down there, we sat there for a while. She was in the, she was there for Close to about a month there in ICU there. I was sleeping out there in the deal and just grabbing what I could there. Mom came up, a friend of mine came up, and 
then, then we finally got her down so she had to be one. And that one day in the night ICU unit so she could travel back home. Then we went. Then so she so we said, well I'm just this is borderline, but I'm gonna put her in a room so we can get you out of here. So we spent the one night there, I spent the whole time there with her and I swear that I know I was hitting the hilltop all the way back to Wichita from Joplin and they beat me by an hour from the ambulance. Then she went right back in the ICU there again. And uh, uh, so then uh, they talked about one time, said we went and dismissed her and put her in to says, you can either go to rehab or she needs to go to home. Well, Ronna said, well, she wanted to go ahead and try to get her strength back up so she'd come home. Well, after that, there's not more, there's less than about three days after that, I get a phone call and says, Larry, we need you up here. She's doing picking stuff out of the eye, out, out of the air. She doesn't know what she's doing. And the day before, I was already talking to him, says, because the doctor is there, and says, there's something to matter because Look at her legs, her legs are all swelled up. I want to see her in the eye and up. And they couldn't produce it. So we went up to the hospital and uh, they put her in the ICU. Had to give her some stuff just to keep her heart beating. They said, there he says, this is no wish we can even take her out the door here. So I said, well, let's just go and take her home so she we can't, we can't do that. She won't be getting out the door. So we went ahead and uh, so I was sitting there, I was praying and just walking back and forth, just like what on her hair like that or stuff. Just trying to see what I wanted to do. So I went ahead and decided that I had to pull the plug. So I called mom and, and I pictured there's probably 30 people there in that little icy room. I see it. So we just gathered around and started praying. Then we sang a song and they said, okay, so we're going to go as we got the foot down close now. The nurse said, we don't want to go back and clean her out. I'll call you when she's about ready. It was probably not more than about 10 or 15 minutes after that that they called the front back in. <coughs> And when we went back in, she died. And I swear, I just swear, I just heard the angel singing. I can feel the, I can feel the pressure, please take her home. Last week, I had asked Jenny in the class, remember, <coughs> if God had been as faithful to her as he had been to Abraham. Mm -hmm. She took a few seconds and then she nodded that she had. When you hear some of these stories, do you understand that God will be just as faithful to you? <coughs> I got a story when God revealed himself to me. It was about a year ago. Um, I was like 14 and I was in the hospital for some reasons. And as I was lying there in that bed, I was so scared. I was just trembling with fear of what was gonna happen. And I could feel God telling me it was gonna be okay. I could feel him. I have never felt him that way before. But I could just feel saying, you're going to get back on your feet and you're going to keep going. And that's exactly what I've done. I keep going. And I'm actually kind of thankful for that hospital visit because I, the closeness I have felt with him, I've never felt that before that hospital visit. That's amazing. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. I, I was so proud this morning. <clears throat> 
old maxim. <coughs> so you know how long it's been since we've seen a teenager at our altars. Mm-hmm. Amen. We live in a culture where Amen. that's rare. That's right. That's right. God's about his hand. That's right. On Amen. Yes, yes. Amen. Amen. We believe in you just like he does. That's <laughs> right. Amen. Yep. Amen. 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 I was blessed. When I was a teenager, I frequented the altar. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, it's like, okay, God, I'm gonna try this again. You know? <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, it's been such a rare thing to see that mm-hmm. in these waning years. And I see Jim and Dad are going to sleep, but I know this. <laughs> <laughs> Normally, it's no one. Yeah. Supervising her tonight. <laughs> and, I, and I know that you have stories surrounding Connie and either her youth years or the years she had the accident or whatever. Do you have something that you could share, or a special way that God came through? And, and I've got another story. Okay. But it's me getting into trouble. Uh, <laughs> that's not a story. Sometimes I'm hurting into trouble. Oh, well, yeah. Uh, not that I would ever get in trouble. But we were studying uh, in the Old Testament at this time. I was working at the travel center. And we studied that the ark was stolen by the Philippines. And they ended up that they were affected with hemorrhoids. <laughs> and rats, and they made golden rats and golden hemorrhoids. Don't ask me how you make a golden hemorrhoid. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and they were just they stuck it into the ark and returned it because they were all dying from this <clears throat> rats and hemorrhoids, which uh, I read later was the bubonic plague. But anyway, that's neither. <laughs> Except we had, uh, as some of you know, I collect uh, paperweights. And at the time, we had one that was kind of this big around. It was by our front door. It was made by Carl Cartwright. And it was beautiful. But it was also it somehow. Fall over. Okay, <laughs> he does something. It should be okay. So he gave it to us. So could see what he made. Well, somebody decided that they needed that paperweight a lot more than we needed the paperweight, and they stole it. And I was very, very unhappy that this paperweight was gone, because I would have rather had it my home than somebody steal it. Yeah. Well, that doesn't look good on me either. Well, anyway, <laughs> remember that little verse about love your neighbor as yourself? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I pray that the people who took that paperweight would get hemorrhoids. <laughs> <laughs> Not return the paperweight. 
sends those things that you needed. Mm -hmm. And I have mentioned before that it just amazes me, and when you listen to the voice of God, he does direct. But it amazes me the songs that Carol picks not knowing what I want to preach on. Amen. Some theophanies of the hearing a voice of the theophany, but even then, those times where maybe we don't see him in a physical sense or even a physical sense, but more blessed are those who have not seen him or heard the voice, but they still believe That's right. than those who had to hear or see. That's we right. saw that scripture tonight, and and we've heard the stories and. Not all of them were theophany in a physical sense of hearing with the ears or seeing with right. eyes. But every one of us are having a sense of the involvement of God. Amen. And it's just as faithful and full as it was with Abraham. That's right. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> you see that in the fresh light? I do. And I want to thank you for your stories tonight. You guys want to hear one more? If somebody has one that's just at the very edge of the <coughs> Diane. Okay. Uh, my mom passed away in 96. And um, 
you know, I, I was just kind of like a, I believed God, I, I believed in God, but I wasn't, I, I wasn't going to church constantly. Um, but anyways, my mom was in the hospital, and she passed away that Saturday, and, um, We was we used to. Uh, I had this TV that I I would have, you know, because I'd have to be to work at Spiegel at six o'clock in the morning, and I had it fixed to where it would come on, and it would be, you know, like the highway patrols. I, I it watched the highway patrols in the morning. Well, that morning, the TV came on, and it was Joyce Myers instead, and I'm like, oh. This isn't the highway patrols, and I'm like, well, you know, and I had I had this thing. I've always, you know, had this thing that if uh, somebody comes to my door like a Jehovah's Witness or Mormon, you know, I'll listen to it because to me that's God sending His word to me somehow. And so I sat and I listened to her, and then I really got to listening to it. And, and after that time, I got to where you know, and you know, it was like uh, she come on there. And I was being so selfish, and um, and you guys know me well enough that I've always had a low self-esteem because I could never figure out why nobody liked me and stuff. Yeah, but you're nobody. <laughs> 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 But uh, Joyce Myers, uh, Joyce Myers came on TV and started saying, "Me, myself, and I. Me, myself, and I." That that sermon, and I remember that. She she came on there, and ever since then, I started um, I started watching Joyce Myers every every morning, and uh, it, you know it brought me back into God's Word, and I just really feel like that was God's way of reaching out and pulling me back in, because you know, and it took. You know, it took me a good 10 years to get over my mom's death. <laughs> yeah. I remember going to work and you talking about Joyce Myers. I remember that. Well, and you remember Jody Young. Uh, her and I just got to uh, talking about, you know, we, we were trainers, and her and I got to talking about Joyce Myers. She goes, oh, my God, I listened to her also. And so I had just given her my Joyce Myers tape that I had sent off for, and uh, she... <coughs> went out to supper with her uh, daughter and her husband that night and she and uh, she had an aneurysm and she just fell dead right there at her supper plate that night mm -hmm. and so um, and her daughter Stacy and I were friends and I was able to get my tapes back and then I, I ended up getting some extras because Stacy ended up giving me Jody's versions of it but you know that was just you know just God was just really touching with me a lot back then so you know, it amazes me how, how God does work, and, and I'm like able to look back on it now, and, and, you know, why I went through such depression, I don't know, but, you know, it's amazing how my mother died, it just never ceases to amaze me, how, you know, there was such a bad storm that night, horrible storm, and Larry and I were both right there in the room, and I was holding my mom, I mean, I just couldn't let go of her, I was just holding her and playing with her hair, and, um, at that moment, there was that strike of lightning and thunder, and um, the, the electricity flickered, and at that very moment, my mother passed. Yeah. It was like the Lord just sent out a lightning rod and took her straight to heaven. Well, I had to give her something to ride. I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, I'm going to ask uh, if Greg would dismiss us and also pray a blessing on the food just provided in the final fellowship. And if you would do that for us, please. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this word this evening. Thank you for being involved in our lives that we may through the same to others, be a blessing to others, and please bless this food and make it into our bodies. We ask always to be blessed to you. Amen. Amen. I want to mention, too, that if some of you had stories you wanted to share or didn't get a chance yet, uh, we'll start Wednesday night by hearing any other stories that you want to bring out. Uh, and if there are none, then that's fine too. We'll go on to our Bible study at that point. But I just want to give you that opportunity. And so, uh, Max, if you can help in the kitchen and get this out. And I'm going to.